Tonight, breaking news. Pfizer saying its vaccine is effective in children ages 5 to 11. The company now asking the FDA for emergency use authorization as pediatric COVID-19 cases jumped 240 percent since July. The Delta variant fueling a surge in hospitalizations across the country. Tonight, our teams inside overwhelmed ICUs from Appalachia to Washington State. Exhausted hospital staff saying the patients are younger and sicker than any other time in this pandemic and Dr. Fauci joins top story. We ask him if the White House botched the booster rollout by getting ahead of the FDA advisory panel. Also tonight, the new developments in the disappearance of Gabby Petito. The FBI today swarming the Florida home of her fiance, who is still on the run. A day after a body believed to be Gabby was found near a Wyoming National Park border emergency, the new images of Border Patrol agents on horseback rounding up Haitian migrants seeking asylum as the U.S. begins a mass expulsion from a Texas border town. The head of Homeland Security there and our reporter pressing him on whether or not his agency was prepared. The deadly school shooting overseas, new video showing students climbing out of windows at a Russian university trying to escape a gunman. The exclusive interview tonight with the son of Osama bin Laden, what he says about being raised by the world's most infamous terrorist, how he supports himself, and what he says about rejecting Al-Qaeda. And it's a red-hot housing market, but the warning tonight before you list your home on Zillow. Top Story starts right now. And good evening, I'm Tom Yamas. We begin tonight with that breaking news. Pfizer says its vaccine is effective in children as young as five years old. In the first of its kind trial, Pfizer and BioNTech said their two-dose vaccine was safe and showed a, quote, robust antibody response in children ages 5 to 11. Participants given a smaller dose than people 12 and older. The company's now submitting their data to the FDA for emergency use authorization. The news comes amid alarming numbers from the American Academy of Pediatrics. Children now accounting for more than one in five new U.S. COVID cases, with the rapidly spreading Delta variant sending more children to hospitals than any other time in this pandemic. And tonight, we go inside ICUs from Tennessee to Washington State, struggling to keep up with the surge of patients, most of them unvaccinated. We have team coverage tonight on the coronavirus throughout this broadcast, including Dr. Fauci, who's joining us to answer mounting questions over vaccines and booster shots. But we begin tonight with Gabe Gutierrez, who leads us off from Spokane, Washington. Tonight, long-awaited data from Pfizer saying its two-dose COVID vaccine is safe and effective for younger children ages 5 to 11. The first of its kind trial for this age group included more than 2,000 kids. They were given a smaller dose than the current vaccine used for those 12 and older. We intend to submit the data by the end of the month. And then, of course, it will be up to the FDA to review that data and determine uh, whether the vaccine can be released for broad use. Public health experts say the need for vaccinating kids is urgent. Pediatric COVID cases in the U.S. have jumped by 240 percent since July. Nationwide, from New York to Philadelphia to South Carolina, more schools are shutting down in-person classes because of outbreaks. I could barely speak full sentences. It was like my uh, breath was like very short. Um, I could barely move. Today, the Biden administration announced stricter testing requirements for unvaccinated Americans abroad looking to travel home. But it also lifted travel restrictions for parts of Europe, China and Iran that have been kept out for more than a year. Starting in November, foreign travelers will need to show proof of vaccination before boarding and the negative COVID test. The older uh, rules were not equitable in our view and they were a bit confusing. All right, you ready? But the pandemic is still raging in some parts of the Northwest. NBC News was granted access to a COVID ICU at Multicare Deaconess Hospital in Spokane, Washington, to show the unprecedented workload here. Over the weekend, three patients died in this ICU within 24 hours. And right now, this hospital is denying more than half of its patient transfer requests from out of state. It's insane. It is very, very hard as, as healthcare workers to say no to patients. Are you surprised by some of the patients that have passed away, how young they have been? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. There are patients that we've had that are younger than me, and it's incredibly difficult. Most of those patients are from neighboring Idaho, where some hospitals have been so swamped they're discussing rationing care. 
On our COVID unit, every patient but one is on a ventilator. Dr. Ben Arthurs tells me at least part of the reason may be the less restrictive public health policies in northern Idaho. How frustrating is it that a year and a half into this pandemic, you're still having to deal with this? Oh, it's This was a really tough week. I'm finishing the end of seven days in the ICU, and I will tell you, it's an emotional roller coaster. Frustration continuing to mount. Gabe Gutierrez joins us now from Spokane, Washington. Gabe, this new Pfizer data is for kids ages 5 to 11, but I want to let our viewers know what's happening with kids who are even younger than that. Yeah, Tom, the company says it expects results on the youngest children under age 5 by the end of this year. Tom. Gabe Gutierrez leading us off on Top Story tonight. Gabe, we thank you for that. I spoke with Dr. Anthony Fauci moments ago. He's the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. I asked him about Pfizer's initial finding that the vaccine is safe for children ages 5 to 11. Do parents have any reason to be concerned about putting the COVID-19 vaccine into their children's arms? Well, they won't have any concern because it's not going to go into the children's arms until the FDA makes the final approval of that. So just because it was announced, and I have every reason to believe that the data are gonna show, which they claim it does, that this vaccine is safe and induces the kind of immune response in children that you would predict would protect them. So I wouldn't think at all that parents need to worry. Vaccines don't go into anyone in this country unless the FDA gives us regulatory approval, and that would be the next step. And to be clear, you believe children do need these vaccines? You know, I really do. Uh, we're seeing right now that there are many, many children, particularly in the context of the Delta variant, that are getting infected. And all you need to do is to go to pediatric hospitals around the country, particularly in the southern states, and you will see that there are many children that are hospitalized now for COVID-19. So we really need to protect the children. Speaking of getting ahead, let's turn now to boosters with some vaccine hesitancy very much active in our communities. Did the president botch the booster rollout by getting ahead of the FDA advisory panel? No, the president did not botch the rollout at all. If you look carefully at the statement from the medical group of which I'm a part together, with the director of the CDC and the acting commissioner of the FDA. And you look carefully at the words of the president in his statement. It is that we are planning to be able to roll out the vaccine booster program during the first during the week of the 20th of September provided. And that's the underlining word that people seem to miss provided that the FDA give it its regulatory approval and that the CDC in association with the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices gives the recommendation. And that worked, that's exactly what happened. Dr. Hodge, to be honest with you, why even set up that artificial deadline of September 20th? Didn't that just sow confusion? And state health officials are saying it has sown confusion. Well, I mean, obviously it has because people are interpreting it as, but it really didn't have to. We wanted to be prepared to be able to roll out the vaccine booster program as soon as we got the OK from the FDA. If you don't plan to be able to roll out expeditiously, you're not going to roll out expeditiously and you might delay a considerable period of time. Dr. Fauci, I want to put a quote on the screen now. This is something you told to KHN Kaiser Health News. It says, we don't think there's enough data to do a booster. This is on the FDA advisory panel. Then so be it, Fauci said. I think that would be a mistake, to be honest with you. Do you still stand by that? Do you think the advisory panel made a mistake on the booster rollout? No, I don't think they made a mistake. We have always felt that you've got to go with the process. And the established process was that what you do is that you let a group of qualified people who are on an advisory committee make a recommendation. On a person-by-person -person basis, my own analysis may have been a little bit different, but I always yield to a group of individuals who come together as a committee and make advice. Do you think boosters are necessary? I think ultimately, well, certainly I believe they're necessary for those who were given the recommendation by the advisory committee. 
I believe when all is said and done and all the data come in, I believe it is highly likely, and that's just my opinion, highly likely that the total optimal regimen will ultimately turn out to be three shots, prime boost, and then a few months later, a third shot for the mRNA vaccines and a second shot for the J&J. &J. I believe that ultimately that's what we're going to arrive at. Dr. Fauci, we thank you for your time tonight. Thank you. Good to be with you. And a programming note, our coronavirus coverage continues in our next half hour with NBC's Dasha Burns going inside a Tennessee hospital where COVID ICU cases have gone from 20 to 400. That's coming up later in the broadcast. We do move on now to our other developing story tonight, the grisly discovery and the search for Gabby Petito. The FBI announcing they have found remains believed to be Gabby's near a Wyoming National Park. And today the FBI raiding the home of Gabby's fiance, who is still on the run. NBC's Miguel Almaguer on the case tonight. Today, the FBI executing a search warrant at the home Brian Laundrie shared with his parents and his fiance, Gabby Petito. At what was called a crime scene, Laundrie's mother and father escorted away by agents who scoured the home looking for leads after their son vanished nearly a week ago. Stretching. Laundry was named a person of interest in Petito's disappearance days before a body was discovered in Wyoming. Human remains were discovered consistent with the description of Gabrielle Gabby Petito. Just inside the Bridger Teton National Forest near a campground, investigators scouring the area but have not released a cause of death. Still a crime scene, it's unclear how much time Petito may have spent here. It's the same area where a woman says she found laundry hitchhiking alone, which police are investigating. He offered to pay us like $200 to give him a ride. The couple who were documenting their cross country journey in a van. Our plan for today is to just hang out. Had spent months together on the road, but came across trouble in Utah. Uh, we drove by and the gentleman was slapping the girl. After a 911 call from witnesses, police wearing body cameras found the pair in a domestic dispute. We have been fighting all morning and in the car before. With no charges filed, their journey continued until Laundry returned home alone earlier this month. Petito's family reporting her missing 10 days later. Her father speaking to Dateline's Andrea Canning Friday. I have a gut feeling that something bad happened to her. I'm not going to I'm not going to get her back. With Gabby Petito gone, family and friends are remembering a life cut short. Her father saying she touched the world. All right, Miguel joins us now live from about 10 miles where the body was discovered. Miguel, we know that FBI officers believe they have recovered the body of Gabby Petito. What are the next steps in this investigation? Well, Tom, they're going to conduct the autopsy tomorrow. So actually, by the end of today, tomorrow, we could actually have the cause of death. Investigators say that's going to be a critical key component to part of their investigation. As for Laundry, he hasn't been seen in six days now, but his family did release a statement calling the discovery of Gabby's body heartbreaking. Tom. All right, Miguel Almaguer for us tonight. Miguel, thank you. On that part of the story, the search is intensifying for Gabby's fiance, Brian Laundry. Let's bring in NBC's Katie Beck, who is in Florida for the latest part of that investigation. And Katie, right now we know that Brian Laundry is a person of interest in the FBI investigation. I understand you and your team actually witnessed investigators finding clues at his home. That's right. They have been out here throughout the day, Tom, starting early this morning and wrapping up with just about a half hour ago. Uh, what they were doing was actually towing a car, a Ford Mustang that we believe belonged to Brian and was used on the day that his parents say he, they last saw him, which was when he said he was going to hike in a reserve and he drove that vehicle there. His parents then told investigators that they brought the vehicle back to the home and today we actually saw it towed from the driveway. We also saw investigators taking out cardboard boxes of evidence. We have to assume some of that is digital evidence, uh, perhaps laptops, iPads, computers, text messages, anything that could connect the timeline of communication as to where this couple was and perhaps even where Brian is now. You know, Katie, according to investigators, Brian goes missing Tuesday. His parents didn't even report him missing until Friday, all the while Gabby Petito is missing the entire time. 
it does raise a lot of suspicion why that was not reported sooner. Obviously, if he left the house on Tuesday to go on a hike and they still are yet to hear from him and didn't report him missing until Friday, uh, investigators are certainly going to be taking that timeline into account, as well as moving the vehicle. If you were expecting him to come back from a hike, why bring the vehicle back to the house? Uh, why was that action taken? These are all questions that I'm sure investigators are circling tonight as this focus seems to be zeroing in on the family. Tom. All right, Katie Beck with that part of the investigation. Katie, thank you. We do head to the border right now with the crisis unfolding at this hour. The U.S. working to deport thousands of Haitian migrants from a Texas border town. New images, take a look at this, showing Border Patrol agents on horseback along the Rio Grande River stopping anyone from crossing over. The head of Homeland Security arriving in Del Rio from Texas today, NBC News correspondent Morgan Chesky was there with him, pressing him on the federal response. Tonight in Del Rio, Texas, this is where thousands without a home wait to see where they'll go tomorrow. Still more than 10,000 migrants in this massive camp, mostly Haitians surviving in makeshift shelters. The group swelling to nearly 15,000 strong this weekend until a mass convergence of law enforcement. Hundreds of state troopers in cars and Border Patrol agents on horseback blocking more people from crossing the river into the United States. It's heartbreaking. Del Rio Mayor Bruno Lozano says calls for help from the Biden administration were mostly ignored till it was too late. I've seen just the desperate looks of the people just trying to, to, to get process. I mean, it's a completely dire situation. Our crew granted exclusive access to speak with those whose future remains uncertain. This woman named Evo told me she's barely eaten over the last week, adding she left Haiti years ago. Today, Texas Governor Greg Abbott requested a federal emergency declaration, blaming the Biden administration for failing to enforce immigration laws and halt illegal crossings. Federal authorities say they've removed 3,300 migrants here so far, 327 deported to Haiti. Others taken to different processing centers in the United States. Senior DHS officials telling NBC News the administration will prioritize deporting single Haitian adults and families not claiming asylum. Unaccompanied children and most families asking for asylum can stay in the U.S. DH Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas visited Del Rio today defending the federal response. Were there enough in place for this surge? I don't think we expected the rapidity of the increase that occurred. What would you tell the woman I met under the bridge that if she goes back to Haiti, her life's in danger? We are um, realistic about the human tragedy of this, but we have a responsibility not only to the well-being of the migrants themselves, but the well-being of the local communities and the American public. All right, Morgan joins us now from Del Rio, Texas Live. That's the border just behind him. You spoke with Secretary Mayorkas. He's been insisting that the border is not open and people should not take this perilous journey. But I wonder, we're seeing thousands of people under that bridge. Is that message getting to the migrants who are risking their lives and crossing oceans and land to get to our border? Yeah, Tom, DHS officials have said the majority of the people that are under this bridge uh, immigrated north from South America, where some had been living for years. As far as whether or not that message is getting out, I can tell you that at least at this border crossing, it most certainly is. The bridge remains closed down above and below. We still have a heavy law enforcement presence. That dam that they were walking across over the past several days is empty. However, there is still very much a concern that while so many resources are here, that could open up more border crossings up and down the Texas border. Tom? Morgan, we've covered these border crises before, but you were telling me that this one feels different? Yeah, Tom, you're exactly right. You go down there and you look at the faces of the folks beneath this bridge about a quarter mile behind me, uh, and you realize that they face uh, so much uncertainty no matter where they end up at this point in time. Uh, the woman I met in that story, Evo, she says that her mother is still in Haiti. Her house is burned down. She has nothing there. And if she goes back home, she is very much afraid for her own life. And yet she's here not knowing where she may end up in the United States. So much uncertainty for every single individual under this bridge. And I think it's important to note uh, they've been here just a few days, but are using whatever they can 
to try to find shelter there, uh, creating temporary thatch roofs with plants that have been pulled up near the Rio Grande River. Uh, just heartbreaking to see uh, impacting so many people in such a concentrated area right here on the Texas border. Tom? And the situation far from over. All right, Morgan, we thank you for your reporting there. We want to turn now to the latest on the situation in Afghanistan. The Pentagon admitting a drone strike last month mistakenly killed at least 10 civilians, including children. NBC News Chief Foreign Correspondent Richard Engel spoke with the heartbroken families. The Afghan family, the Pentagon now admits it mistakenly targeted and attacked with a drone, killing 10 innocent civilians, including seven children, is demanding more than just an apology. They shouldn't kill innocent people, and they need to get us to a safe place, he said. CCTV footage obtained by the New York Times shows the man the Pentagon claimed was an ISIS terrorist was actually working for a U.S. aid agency. And before the drone strike, he was putting water jugs in his car, not bombs. The U.S. military said it had intel that a white Toyota Corolla, like his, could be used in an ISIS attack. It's also one of the most popular vehicle makes and colors in Kabul. I'm here today to set the record straight and acknowledge our mistakes. Now in control of Afghanistan, the Taliban may be showing their true colors. And women are back on the streets, protesting after public schools restarted, but no high school for girls. The Taliban say the lockout is temporary while they work out logistics to separate boys and girls. But most female government employees are also being told to stay home for the same reason. Our Richard Engel now out of Kabul joining us here live in studio. Richard, my question to you, our team spoke with the family members of those who died. They want out of Afghanistan. Will the U.S. help them? It's hard to know. And first of all, it's great to be here, especially on your opening night. Uh, so congratulations. But it's hard to know if the U.S. will grant them that exit visa. Everyone in Afghanistan right now seems to want to leave the country, especially in Kabul. And every day I get text messages, not, not from this family, but from other families who say, we want out. Can you help us? Can you help us? Now, they all didn't get accidentally killed, have family members killed in a drone strike, and many believe that the U.S. has an obligation here. They've been exposed as having worked uh, for a U.S. aid project. Their family name has been associated with ISIS. So they could make, a, they have a very good case to make that they are now, because of U.S. action, U.S. action that caused grave distress and harm and fatalities, that they are entitled. So uh, the U.S. may in, end up giving them asylum, but the issue is everyone there right now is burdening the system, and so many people are making claims, and many people have legitimate claims as well. This was a drone strike by the U.S. We've also heard of some explosions, possibly combat in Jalalabad. What exactly is happening right now? How would you describe the country of Afghanistan? Ooh. It's very, it's probably the most bizarre story I've, I've ever covered, and I've covered a lot of strange stories, because you had the Taliban roll in and seize all of these weapons, and the Taliban are a profoundly religious group. People sort of forget that in this equation. They know they're, they're hardline, they're fundamentalists. They believe they've been swept into power with the grace of God. So you look in their eyes, and their eyes are a little too bright, and they believe this was a miracle. So that's why they're being so incredibly friendly to people come up, because they want to talk about this miracle. Now, there are problems that are starting to set in. Mm -hmm. Some women are coming out to protest. There's some hunger issues. There's economic pain. And they have a rival group. It's much smaller, but they have ISIS. And it seems like those explosions uh, that happened in Jalalabad is as, uh, as members of, of the Taliban are going after ISIS. And there have been several different explosions. That they're not talking about it very much, but they have, uh, they've been put out, the, the Taliban have put out the word that they want to try and round up these, these ISIS fighters and, and take them off the battlefield. The fighting continues, but so does the reporting. It is good to have you here in New York. I'm glad you and your team are safe. We know you will be back out there very we soon. We will, and congratulations again. And hopefully we'll be doing more reporting for this new great show. Thanks so much, Richard. We do appreciate that. And we want to actually stay overseas right now to Russia. That's where we head next, where a gunman opened fire at a state university, killing six and injuring dozens. Videos posted to social media show students jumping out of windows on campus trying to escape. NBC's Priscilla Thompson has that story. Harrowing scenes out of Russia Monday. Students seen jumping from first and second floor windows and running to safety after a gunman opened fire at Parham State University. At least six people are dead and 28 injured, according to authorities.
Witnesses describe scenes of chaos and panic. There was a man armed with a shotgun. He was walking as he took shots. We ran in different directions and none of us got hurt. When we understood that he was shooting at us, we started running inside like a herd of sheep. He chased us like a shepherd to the entrance. The suspect is being treated at a local hospital after being shot by police, officials say. Law enforcement officials have not publicly identified the man, but say he's a student at the university. The officer who shot the suspect now detailing the encounter. I ran into the building to the first floor and saw an armed young man coming down the stairs. I called out to him, drop it, but he pointed the gun at me and fired. After that, I used my firearm. The young man fell. The shooting began at around 11 a.m. local time at the university, which is 800 miles east of Moscow. Police say the gunman used a smoothbore hunting rifle purchased legally in May. Tonight, the investigation continues as Russian President Vladimir Putin offers his condolences. This is a huge disaster, and not just for the families who have lost their children, but for the country as a whole. The governor of Pear has declared September 21st a day of mourning for a community still grappling with their loss. And Russia recently tightened their gun ownership laws after a school shooting in May. Over the past decade, they haven't had more than around one school shooting per year. But today's attack marks the second school shooting in the past five months. Tom? Priscilla Thompson for us tonight. Priscilla, thank you. Back here in the States, we're also following breaking news out of Wall Street. It's been a long time since the market has faced a sell-off of this magnitude. The Dow had its biggest one-day drop since July. The S&P 500 and NASDAQ composite also tumbled amid some emerging risks for the market. So what exactly is going on? NBC News senior business correspondent Stephanie Rule joins us now. Steph, thanks for being here on set. So my first question to you is what happened today and what should people think when it comes to their 401ks? Well, well, a number of things. We start overseas in China, Evergrande, a massive Chinese conglomerate, is at risk of defaulting on $300 billion worth of debt. And $300 billion. billion. Okay. And you're thinking, I never heard of that company. Here's why it matters. It is a signal that the global economy might not be as strong as we thought it was. While here at home, more gridlock in Washington. We still don't have a budget agreed upon, which means there could be a federal government shutdown. On top of that, lawmakers are still not seeing eye to eye on infrastructure structure or the debt ceiling and the Federal Reserve is meeting this week, they could signal that they could look to raise interest rates in the future. And lastly, the consumer, you and me. While we are still out there spending, we're less optimistic about the economy going forward than we have been in the last few months. And that's because the Delta variant is spreading. And you and I both know prices are high out there. All of this has Wall Street concerned. So as the market was dropping, some banks put out guidance to their investors saying, hey, maybe now is a good time to buy stuff stocks because March stocks were so expensive before. They call it buying the dips and selling the rips. But you want to tell our viewers that this is not always smart to try to time the market. Timing the market is truly for the pros. Now, if you have had stocks that you've been looking to buy for a while that you want to be a long term investor of, well, yes, this day, this week might be a time to buy because things have gotten cheaper today. But if you're saying, hey, this is my time to play the market. Remember the word play. You are playing a game and in a game, somebody wins and somebody loses and there's a chance you could be that loser. So if you're willing to risk that money, have at it. But playing the market, that's for the pros. Stephanie Rule, always with the best advice. Steph, thanks. Now, when we come back, the shooting at a Virginia high school, two 17-year-old students shot what we're learning about the suspected gunman. Plus the volcano emergency in Spain's Canary Islands. Take a look at that. Lava pouring into a neighborhood and destroying dozens of homes. The evacuation is now underway. And raised by Osama bin Laden, our exclusive interview, the son of the former Al-Qaeda leader, what he says about his father and his life since leaving Afghanistan. That's coming up. Tonight's top story has an exclusive interview with the son of Osama bin Laden. NBC News senior international correspondent Keir Simmons has more on Omar bin Laden and the impact of being raised by the world's most notorious terrorist. With a beret and a moustache, he styles himself as a landscape painter. Take a closer look at his face and the way he signs his paintings, OBL. He is the son of one of the world's most notorious killers, Osama bin Laden.
raised to be an Al-Qaeda leader. Omar bin Laden now lives in Normandy, France, thousands of miles from his former home in Afghanistan. Come out of my in his first US television interview, he weighs his words carefully, telling us his childhood memories influence much of his work. Some painting has come out of my uh, feeling, what I saw in my past or my history. This canvas depicting Afghanistan's Tora Bora Mountains, his father's hideout, the fiery red expressing Omar's reflections of life there. This uh, mountain, it's, uh, it's so much and I live in it for a while. As a boy from aged 10, he was surrounded by the scars of war, first in Sudan, then Afghanistan. The young Omar schooled in the ideology of Al-Qaeda. Afghanistan, one of the most uh, uh, remembering uh, time in my life. And one of the toughest one too. So many pain and, uh, and victims and uh, suffering. In his memoir, he describes his father's mad world. Omar says on one occasion his pet puppies were used for chemical weapons experiments. He says he was even taught to drive a tank. Ultimately rejecting Al-Qaeda's twisted doctrine. Today, he says, he'd like to be an ambassador for peace. So much money, trillions and trillions spent on fighting and killing people when there is uh, so many countries with uh, uh, very poorness. And he told us he agrees with President Biden's decision to withdraw U.S. forces from Afghanistan. I think Biden done the best decision since 20 years ago. Moving on from the past remains a struggle in the Middle East and for the son of Osama bin Laden. I think the world uh, changed after uh, September 11. And from that day till today, I am suffering. And uh, the same with uh, a lot of uh, millions of the people around the world. And Kier joins us now. Kier, I'm curious, Omar bin Laden, it seems, is seeking sympathy. How strongly has he disavowed his father, who killed so many innocent people, then hid out while even more people died? Well, you know, Tom, he has said of his upbringing, I couldn't stand it. I hated it. Osama bin Laden brutalized even his own children. They weren't even allowed to smile or to laugh. Ultimately, Omar bin Laden walked away and never looked back. You know, here you showed there in your story how Omar signs his paintings OBL. Does he fear for his life at all being out in the public like this as an artist? And how does he support himself living in France trying to be a painter? Tom, he, he has described some difficult moments when people recognize him, when they realize who he is, confrontations. But, you know, honestly, nothing could be as frightening as being brought up by Osama bin Laden. And he says he was pretty much cut off by the bin Laden family. So painting and the other things that he tries to do, that's pretty much what he's got, Tom. Keir Simmons with that top story exclusive tonight. Keir, we thank you for that. When we come back, push the limit. Our team goes inside a Tennessee hospital where the number of COVID patients, get this, has jumped nearly 2,000% since July, what their exhausted and frustrated staff told our reporter. And Manny Pacquiao's latest fight, the prize boxer, stepping in to a new political race. The details coming up. Back now with Top Stories News Feed. We start with a shooting at a Virginia high school. Police say two 17-year-old students were shot at Heritage High School in Newport News but are expected to recover. Another teenager was taken into custody. It's unclear if he was a student at the school, but police believe the shooting was targeted. The Supreme Court will hear arguments for Mississippi's abortion case beginning December 1st. The justices will consider the legality of the state's ban on most abortions after 15 weeks of pregnancy. Another major challenge of Roe v. Wade. It comes after the high court declined to block Texas's restrictive abortion law. Today marks four years since Hurricane Maria slammed into Puerto Rico, and many are still feeling the devastation. Homes across the island yet to be fixed, and work has not begun to modernize the decimated power grid, which is leading to constant power outages. The country also facing a decades-long financial crisis that was worsened by the COVID-19 pandemic.
and a piece of American history going up for auction. A first edition printed copy of the U.S. Constitution will hit the auction block in November. It's just one of 11 surviving copies of the first printing that was produced for delegates of the 1787 Constitutional Convention and Continental Congress. It also is the last in private hands. Sotheby's expecting bids up to $20 million. All right. Now to an inside look at a Tennessee hospital system facing its worst days since the pandemic began. Cases increasing by 30 percent just last week. ICUs inundated with unvaccinated patients and hospital staff to overwork. All of this happening as vaccination efforts in the area stall. Dasha Burns has the latest from the front lines tonight. Tonight, desperation in the halls of maxed out ICUs in Appalachia. Can you put into words how you feel coming into work every day? We're exhausted. We are mentally exhausted, emotionally exhausted, beyond physically exhausted. Amber Wagner is a mom of two and a nurse manager at Ballot Health, the hospital system serving the rural communities of the Appalachian Highlands. They say they've hit a COVID peak they never thought possible. Did you think that it could get this bad? No. Unfortunately, um, a lot of people have chosen to not take the vaccine, and our numbers are higher. Our patients are sicker. Our patients are younger. They're mothers who may or may not see their children again. They're fathers. And it is so hard knowing that when you put these patients on a ventilator, there's a good chance they're not going to come off. The spike in hospitalizations at Ballot Health startling, skyrocketing in just over two and a half months from 20 patients over the July 4th weekend to 396 this past week, an almost 2,000 percent jump. For the last three weeks, ICUs have been full in this entire region. And when a room does open up, it's likely because a patient passed away. That's what happened right here just overnight. And the nurses tell me this room will be full by the end of the day. This is one of our ICU. Now there are more patients than the winter peak when NBC News was with the hospital staff. They thought they were seeing the worst of it then. Every day we have patients pass. Misinformation about the reality of COVID landing patients in the ICU and frustrating healthcare staff. Just this week we have an ICU patient. He was in complete disbelief that he had COVID or that he was as sick as he was. But with the spring came hope as the vaccine became available. We see light at the end of the tunnel, so hopeful, we're hopeful. That hope turning to helplessness as residents continue to resist getting vaccinated. It just knocked the wind out of you all over again. 98% of Ballot Health's ICU patients did not get the shot. I've had many patients say, when I get out of here, I'm gonna go get vaccinated. But from my experience, they've not been given that chance because they haven't been able to walk out of the hospital. Between the increase in patients and a shortage of staff, nurses are battling burnout. It is so hard. The sacrifices that you make for your family when you leave home. And your kids are crying because they don't want you to leave because you haven't seen them in days. That's when it's a hard. These healthcare professionals, both physically and emotionally drained, we saw it right there. Dasha Burns joins us now from Johnson City, Tennessee. Dasha, you've been reporting on nurses at this hospital system for almost a year now. How have things changed for them personally since you first met? Yeah, Tom, you know, I first met many of these nurses over the Thanksgiving holiday last year. I've visited a lot since then, and I have seen these heroes find strength in some of the darkest of times. But, Tom, I have to tell you, this time it did feel different. The fact that this virus is now preventable is adding a whole new level of heartbreak here. And remember, this is a small rural community, so a lot of these nurses, they're caring for people they know, their neighbors, their high school football coach, their kid's teacher, combined that with a staffing shortage where now you've got nurses who typically care for two patients in one shift, caring for three, four, five patients in a shift. And I'm meeting nurses who are working 12 hour shifts, six days a week, Tom. And when you're in the room with them, it's palpable, not just the physical exhaustion, but their spirits are all but broken at this point, Tom. Dasha Burns with us tonight with a very important story. Dasha, we thank you for that.
We want to turn now to the Americas. We have shown you the images of thousands of migrants at the U.S. border with Mexico, a majority of them from Haiti. And now NBC's Vaughn Hilliard shows us where their dangerous and lengthy journey began. Deep in the jungle in Panama, parents clinging to their children, bracing for the hundreds of miles ahead. Thousands of migrants, many of them Haitian, hoping to soon reach the United States. But this is just one stop on a journey that for many extends more than a decade in thousands of miles. One that requires passing through here, the treacherous mountainous jungle called the Darien Gap near the border of Panama and Colombia. Panamanian officials say about 70,000 migrants have made the trek this year alone. Most of these Haitians now arriving to the U.S. border have lived in Central or South America for years, finding refuge there after the 2010 earthquake that killed more than 200,000 in their homeland. They fled for countries like Chile and Brazil, which at the time needed workers and initially even offered humanitarian visas. Just how large of a Haitian population there is that has been residing over the last 10 years in South America, in Central America. These are individuals who left earlier periods of unrest and went to countries like Chile in the tens of thousands to be able to find some sort of security there. Haiti's foreign minister in 2016 told the Miami Herald that 40,000 Haitians were living in Ecuador at the time, another 60,000 in Chile, and more than 95,000 in Brazil. But now, years later, as the pandemic endures and countries' economies increasingly tighten, many of those migrants set off to find refuge yet again, but further north. Now, a remarkable number in distress waiting at the doorstep of America. But their route will not end here, the Biden administration says. Most will be removed from the country under a COVID-era public health policy. They're maintaining Trump-era policies, but I think that there's a perception that perhaps they are being more welcoming than they actually are. People want to leave. There's a perception perhaps that the Biden administration might be more welcoming despite of the realities of the ground. Their destination? now the very place they first fled, the poorest nation in the Western Hemisphere. Now the Biden administration is using a federal statute, a public health law called Title 42, that allows them to deny these individuals from seeking and applying for asylum based off of concern of the spread of a severe communicable disease. Now, this is currently being challenged in the court, but at the same time, a judge just this Thursday said that the Biden administration was able to deport individuals so long as they were not unaccompanied minors and families. And that is why you are seeing these planes take off now with thousands back to Haiti. Tom? Vaughn, with our look at the Americas tonight. Vaughn, we thank you for that. Next to the volcano emergency in the Spanish Canary Islands, have you seen this video? It's drone video showing lava flowing into a neighborhood, wiping out everything in its path. Houses up in flames with an estimated 100 homes destroyed so far. More than 5,000 people have been evacuated, including hundreds of tourists. The country's military called in to help. So far, no injuries or deaths reported. And prize boxer Manny Pacquiao is now running for president in the Philippines. The 42-year-old says he has accepted his party's nomination for the 2022 election. He currently serves as a senator in the Asian nation. The champion boxer pledged to fight poverty and corruption as well as the current president's term comes to an end. Okay, still ahead, caution for homeowners looking to sell. Posting on popular sites like Zillow could save money on real estate agent fees. But NBC's Vicki Wynn joins us live in studio. She's in the house getting answers to break down how the site could make it harder for potential buyers to find your listing. Stay with us. Tonight with a red hot housing market, many people are looking to sell and a growing number of homeowners are turning to sites like Zillow to save on real estate fees. But in tonight's Spotlight report, NBC News investigative and consumer correspondent Vicki Wynn shares why it might not be so easy or profitable. Home after home, hundreds of thousands of properties available at your fingertips on Zillow. But if you're looking to sell without a real estate agent representing you, some homeowners say Zillow and its affiliate Trulia can make it harder for buyers to ever see your listing. I thought, let's give it a try. Heather Tomayasu told us she tried selling her home in New York without a real estate agent to save tens of thousands of dollars. Why do I want to pay 
this huge commission to a realtor when I don't think I really need them. So she posted her home on Zillow for sale by owner. But instead of getting calls from oh, interested God. buyers, I started getting bombarded by really annoying realtors. Real estate agents calling to see if she wanted to work with them. In January, Zillow updated its website, making it harder for buyers to see homes listed for sale by owner. Just watch what happens when I search for homes in a place like Dallas. It shows me thousands of listings in the area, but those are not the only homes for sale. By default, Zillow only shows me the homes that are listed by a real estate agent on a multiple listing service. To see homes listed for sale by owner, you have to click on this tab called Other Listings. Consumers are not seeing these homes. Michael Toth is an attorney for Rex, an online brokerage company that helps people sell their homes, charging an average 3.3% commission compared to the 5 to 6% from traditional real estate agents. American home buyers deserve better. American home sellers deserve more choice. Rex filed an antitrust lawsuit against Zillow and the National Association of Realtors, alleging they make it harder to find homes not represented by an agent. According to a Rex analysis of 14 properties from earlier this year, the average listing with a real estate agent on Zillow got 212 page views, while homes in the other tab only had 34. That's 84 percent fewer views. Well, I'm not surprised that a little tweak to a website interface could have such a big impact. Benjamin Keyes is a professor of real estate at the Wharton School who says the current online marketplace makes it harder to sell without an agent. I think there are legitimate concerns about whether there is equal access for those who are using a realtor and those who are not. One more hurdle, if a buyer gets to a for sale by owner listing like this one, there's a big message button at the top. Click on that. It doesn't actually put you in touch with the homeowner trying to sell the home. Instead, it sends you to a bunch of different real estate agents hoping to represent you. To contact the actual seller, you have to scroll down to here. In a statement, Zillow says it provides a free service to help consumers advertise their homes for sale by owner, a service most other real estate websites do not provide, adding that outdated rules required Zillow to change the way listings appear, and they call Rex's claims without merit. The National Association of Realtors tells NBC News how Zillow displays listings is between Zillow and each local multiple listing service, pointing out the court has said Rex is not likely to prevail in its antitrust lawsuit. Key says there are benefits to using an agent. A real estate agent is going to provide a lot of guidance into how to market the property, how to take the best pictures, where to set the right asking price. All right, Vicki Wynn joins us now in studio. Vicki learned a lot from this story, but I do want to go back to Heather. Was she able to sell her home? Yeah, Heather, after sitting on the market with her home for a few weeks and she had few leads, she eventually just gave up. She did end up trying to hire a realtor and was able to sell her home in just two weeks, but she paid that full commission. So what is the government doing? Are they, are they looking more into this? Yeah, well, the Department of Justice recently broadened the scope of an investigation into the National Association of Realtors. The DOJ is now looking at claims that the group is asking sites like Zillow to put for sale by owner listings in a separate search tab. The NAR told us they have no say in how websites like Zillow operate, but very interesting, and we will be following it, Tom. Okay, Vicki Wynn, love to have you here. Thank you so much for that. All right, when we come back, K-pop heads to the United Nations. Why star boy band BTS was before the UN General Assembly today, and the massive, and you won't believe how many, because it was huge, number of people who tuned in to watch. Stay with us, you're watching Top Story. Back now with the star power at the UN General Assembly. All seven members of the superstar K-pop group BTS appearing before the UN today. They were invited by South Korea's president to speak on a range of topics, including the pandemic's effect on young people and climate change. And their very dedicated fan base taking over the UN's YouTube page with one million people tuning in to the meeting's live stream and tens of thousands of people flooding the comments page. All right. Finally, it is Hispanic Heritage Month, and we want to introduce you to some of the Hispanics on our team here at NBC that bring you the news every day. They come from diverse backgrounds and places. Bringing the news to you is not only a job, it's an honor, and none of them take it for granted. So I am Colombian, born and raised in a little city of Bucaramanga, Bucaramanga, Colombia. My grandfather is originally from Mexico. My grandmother is originally from Spain. It's a little complicated, so I'm half Puerto Rican, uh, and my mom is from Maine.
having the experiences with my Hispanic family absolutely influences the way that I look at almost every story that I do and the way that I approach all of the stories that I try to do. So much of covering politics is not only understanding the candidates, but understanding the communities that these candidates are trying to get in touch with. Especially when covering Latino issues and Hispanic issues, I, I go in there with more kindness and, and more humanity because I see myself in, in the people that I cover. I, as a Mexican-American, don't know what it's like to be a Venezuelan-American or a Colombian-American. And I think there's a lot of nuance between what it means to be a Miami Cuban or you know, you're El Salvadorian in Los Angeles or you're first generation Mexican in, you know, McAllen, Texas. It's important to not have just one singular Hispanic producer, correspondent or um, even interview subject. Para mí, eh, el idioma español es como una llave. Usted entiende más. Usted se puede relacionar más con esa gente. I moved to the U.S. in August 31st, 2006. I was 11 years old. My mom and I, it was so much colder than we thought it was going to be. We lived in Jersey, and to warm ourselves up, we would come to the city and just kind of go to the touristy spots. And 30 Rock was one of those spots. We walked right in front of Rockefeller Center, and we took a picture. It's a terrible picture. There was, like, people behind us. It's not well framed. But it was one of the first times where we kind of saw, like, the magic of the United States. So we took that picture 15 years ago, right over there. And then now today, September 2021, I'm an associate producer at the same building that we stood in front of. There's nothing more important than your cultural identity and your language and where you come from. Va a ser parte de usted de aquí hasta que no estamos en este mundo. And we are so proud of all of our employees here at NBC News, especially Ricardo, who you just heard from right there, who works on this show. Thanks so much for watching Top Story, our first show. If you enjoy it, tell your friends, tell your neighbors, and anyone else you know, maybe even people you don't like. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. Thank you for watching and for trusting us. Good night. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.